Welcome, welcome. Let me start by introducing my panelists so that when you say hello to them, you will know who you're talking to. In Indianapolis, in America, we've got Robert Kojuang. Kojuang, if you could say hello to our guests as well as to the listeners. Hello, Mr. Miguna. This is Robert Kojuang from Indianapolis, uh, Indiana, Hello, USA. And if we could now say, um, call Bernard Omweri from Minnesota in America to also say hello to our guests as well as to the listeners. Hello, Bona Governor Muguna Muguna. Welcome to AKD Radio Show. Thank you. And now I would like um, Ephraim Imaya from London, UK, to say hello to our guest, Miguna Miguna, as well as to the listeners. Hello, Governor Miguna. Welcome. And um, then I would like Patrick Thierry from Alberta in Canada to also say hello to our guest, Miguna Miguna, and as well to the listeners. Governor Miguna, welcome. Hello, uh, listeners. Karibu. And uh, finally, this is me, Sheila Maonga, calling from London, UK. I would like now to formally welcome um, Governor Miguna Miguna to our um, AKD radio. Tafadali Mgeniwetu, could you say hello to the panelists and as well to, as to the listeners? Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 Oh, you're very, we're very, we're very welcome and honored to have you. This is AKD Radio. We have a list of questions here that we've compiled from uh, our members, the members of Association of Kenyans in the Diaspora. And if we could just go straight to them because of time. Uh, Miguna, Miguna, if you can hear me clearly, what uh, our listeners would love, love to know about you is uh, what makes you happy? <laughs> That is, that is a very, very funny question. What makes me happy? Yes. What makes me happy is justice. Justice for the underprivileged. Justice for the oppressed. Justice for the exploited. And justice for the, um, the suppressed. That ah. is, that's what would be. So as you can tell, I've not been a very happy camper. Oh. <laughs> I am I am very sorry to hear that. One other question that our listeners would also like to know is what is your favorite food and how frequently do you eat it? So my favorite food uh, is obviously fish. Daily. I'm 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 a lure. So yes. I enjoy I there is no lure I know of that does not enjoy ugali and that remains my favorite. Oh, and how frequently do you eat it? Uh, as frequently as you can in North America. It's not as frequent as I would like it, but when I'm in Kenya, almost every other day. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for answering that. If we could move on to other questions as well. Uh, it has been reported that you want to run for the position of the governor of Nairobi City County. On what party ticket do you want to do so and why? Uh, I don't know why people ask the way it is asked. What party? The people are still stuck on the old constitution. They had a new constitution of 2010. Mm -hmm. In the new constitution, it gives everyone and, and it, mm -hmm. it says everyone whether through a party or just yourself you can run for any office even the presidency so mm -hmm. i will be running as an independent i don't need a party to run mm -hmm. yes and and in any uh, event yes uh, parties names do not appear on the ballot it's just individuals mm -hmm. even uhuru kenyatta mm -hmm. will just be running as uhuru kenyatta's president even though he has a party so mm -hmm. at the end of the day, really, the, the, the person that people vote for, for any position, is just a person. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. So um, how would you rate your chances of success? Uh, that is uh, not a good question. Uh, because I don't think any candidate should be able to do. 
-hmm. candidate can speak of their strengths, a candidate can speak of their platform, a candidate can speak of their vision, a candidate can speak of their ideology, but a candidate should not be presumptuous, presumptuous enough to say, I've mm -hmm. evaluated the chances and this is it. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. I think I have chances because if I didn't, I wouldn't contest. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you why, without rating yeah. it. Mm -hmm. All the other candidates um, come from the two coalition uh, parties. They are actually not candidates. They are just aspirants because the parties have not done their nomination. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Jubilee and then you look at Cord in Kenya today, um, the amount of money that is being given to the county is mm -hmm. the development that that money does for example, in Nairobi, mm -hmm. um, is minimal because of misappropriation and corruption. Mm -hmm. Money is diverted to individual pockets instead of going to service delivery. Mm -hmm. And that affects both parties. So in a way, it demonstrates to Kenyans that parties don't deliver, at least in Kenya. Mm -hmm. That both parties and coalitions are basically the same when we are talking about corruption. Idero is as corrupt as Ranguma in Kisumu, as, say, for example, uh, the governor of Mombasa, governor of Moranga, or any other governor in Kenya. There is none that you can say has delivered on the mandate that is provided to them by the Constitution. And the Auditor, well, it, General, the Auditor General has been consistent on how much money Kenyans have lost. So I come if in, I, Yes. Uh, if I could just finish, I know that you, you are pressed for time. Yes, yes, I, go ahead. You can. I come in as the only person who does not belong to either party and does not come with the baggage of this corruption. My record is very clear in public service. I worked for... Uh, the former prime minister for three years as his senior most advisor. There has been no allegation of corruption. I've never been involved in any. I've practiced law for 21 years. I have had no complaints to the law society. I have had no complaints of misappropriation of public funds. So when you have that against the characters that we have, the people will have a choice between integrity and corruption. So, do you feel you have the experience needed to run Nairobi? Uh, I don't know what you mean by experience. I can run Kenya. It's, oh, this okay. Do tell us how. I mean, yes. Mandela spent 27 years in jail. What experience did he get in Robben Island when he became president in 1994? What experience did? Uh, Vaclav Avel in Czechoslovakia get when he was in jail for five, for five years. What experience did Obama get uh, as a community organizer in the U.S. before he became president? You don't need any experience except competence and integrity. That's all you need in public life. You need people who are honest, need mm -hmm. people who, know their, uh, who have a commitment to discharging their public responsibilities properly. What experience does uh, Sonko has? He's barely literate. He's a, he's a senator and he's running uh, for the governorship, and many people think he's very strong. What experience does he have? What experience did Kidero have before he became governor? He looted and bankrupted Mumia. That is the experience you have in Kenya. So when people say, what experience, I sometimes wonder, are you looking for people who have participated in bankrupting public uh, institutions. Is that the only experience that matters in Kenya? I believe that my experience as being clean, a professional who has worked for over 20 years as a lawyer in Canada and Kenya, places me in a very, very good position to see Nairobi to prosperity. Well, thank you very much for that. Now, the next question is, um, who is your support base? Who do you think will vote for you? The same Kenyans that are voting for everybody else. I don't come from Mars. I come from Kenya, and I live in Nairobi. Okay. The 
then um, one other thing that when we were asking, um, when we were drafting these questions, one other thing that many people seem to feedback is that uh, sometimes your character can come out can come out as a bit of brash and abrasive and uh, quite um, quick to criticize others and pointing out failures in people. How would you mitigate this perception as a people's representative? That is a very good perception. Why should I entertain okay. mediocrity? I mean, you need mm-hmm. a leader that will not entertain mediocrity. That's good in a leader. A leader yes. that does not entertain nonsense is good. I mean, yes. what people expect, I, I mean, Kenyans, I, I don't understand what Kenyans, what Kenya has become now. It's a country where fake humility, that a thief goes to church on Sunday mm-hmm. and pretends mm-hmm. to be very, very humble, pretends, then leaves church and goes and steals. Then, like mm-hmm. in the case of Kidero, he even fights people publicly, slaps Chavez, fights with Sonko in the Senate, and he's supposed to be humble. Miguna, who does not fight with anybody physically, but only talks about corruption and fights the corrupt, that is the one who is abrasive. You see how values have co- it's upside down. I am abrasive against corruption and will never apologize and will never stop. And I believe that is what Kenyans want. When Michuki, uh, and, and he was not like a, a very good leader in terms of integrity and whatnot, but when he took the Ministry of Transport, was he laughing with people when he was trying to straighten the Batatu business in Kenya? You don't need that. We are not looking for the Pope. We are not looking for Mother Teresa. This is not a church profession. This is leadership. And what you expect of a leader is decisiveness. Don't be mm-hmm. nice. I'm not trying to woo a woman to marry. I already have a wife. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguna Miguna. Uh, just to remind the listeners, this is AKD Radio, and today our guest of honor is Miguna Miguna. I would like to invite my fellow panelists, Robert Kojuang in America, to take over the next set of questions. Kojuang, if you can hear me, your yes, floor, please. Thank you. Okay. Oh, my question to Honorable Miguna oh, is the Nairobi City Council has some challenges that are unique to it. Traffic congestion and transportation, water and power shortage, crumbling infrastructure, deplorable urban planning that leads to insecure structures, and, and all that kind. How do you propose to tackle all these challenges as governor of Nairobi City Council? That's a, a good question. Let me tell you this. All the problems of Nairobi are not unique to The problems of Nairobi uh, are urban problems that would affect any urban area. In 2005, um, Governor Fashola, now a Minister of State for Infrastructure in Nigeria, took over when Lagos was worse than uh, Nairobi. The traffic in Lagos was worse than any other traffic in the world, with the exception of Mexico City. You couldn't move from the airport uh, to anywhere within a day. It would take you eight hours. There was no solid waste management system. And Lagos was much bigger than Nairobi. It was already more than 10 million people in Lagos. Within five years, because of strong, clear, and ethical leadership. Lagos has one of the best solid waste management systems in the world, and traffic moves everywhere else in Lagos. Now, when you look at Nairobi, what is it that is lacking? What is lacking is a leader that will spend his entire time, energy, and effort in solving the problems that are there with the amount of money that is allocated both by the Treasury uh, through the, 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 the allocations that happens to county, through levies, and through strategic uh, borrowing, to be able to use this money effectively in solving the problems instead of diverting it to people's pockets. So number one, leadership. That's what Nairobi needs. That's what Nairobi lacks. Number two, the moment you root out corruption, because people always talk about, oh, there is no money, we lose like last 
uh, financial year, according to the Auditor General, over 200 billion Kenya shillings. That's a lot of money. That's over 2 billion US dollars. That can build all the roads in Nairobi in one year. Make them wide, install all the lights, make sure that people obey the traffic lights and the traffic moves. It is also enough, more than enough, in five years, because you just have to multiply that times five, to build even a subway system. Nairobi is the only city of five million people in the modern world where there is no uh, transportation underground. You cannot transport five million people within the geographic space of Nairobi without having a rapid rail system, without having a subway system. You need that. The getting rid of, of garbage is the easiest one, the solid waste management. Then just getting rid of the slums. Let me tell you this, because I've not told many people this, but this will work. If I went today as governor of Nairobi and approached Bill Gates and told Bill Gates that the only thing I would like his foundation to do for Kenyans and Nairobi is to help me deal with the slum situation, the homelessness, the fact that nearly 60% of Nairobians live in inhabitable conditions. Those slums are not homes. And I tell them, I do not want to touch the money. I just want you to fund me, but I want you to bring the people that will be handling this money to purposes of getting rid of the slums. You know, they will do it for free. The only reason you cannot get that money injected right now is because they fear the money will be stolen. But if they have somebody who is a leader, who is not going to steal, and who does not touch that money, that work can be done very easily. I'm just giving you an example. So what people think is impossible is actually very, very possible. And if you, if you just going back to your answer, which you just said, that uh, you talk about big gates, how do you think that, uh, what kind of strategy will you have to, to have big gates rolling in billions no, of money? No, no, I'm now. giving you an example. I'm telling you that right. I want to do that. I'm not saying that is the only thing or that is actually even with it. We have enough money. I'm saying to begin with, we have enough money. Uh, because I don't know if you know this, the city of Gaberon, because I can only give you examples that exist, and some examples, most of the examples are in Africa, because most people say, oh, don't give us foreign ex uh, examples. This is Africa. So I'll give you African examples. Right. The city of Gaberon in Botswana, most of the city was built in three years. Three years. Not five, not ten, not fifteen, not twenty. If you look at Rwanda, Kigali, since um, um, Kagame took power, right. Rwanda is a landlocked country with a population of less than Nairobi. And Rwanda has no resources other than human resources which most of it is also Im imported from Kenya, as for Rwanda, right? right? Most of the people running its banks are Kenyan. Most people running its ICT are Kenyan. Most people running its power installations are Kenyan. Most of the engineers are Kenyans. Architects are Kenyans. Rwanda has been growing at the rate of more than 11% for the last 15 years. And Kigali, if you go to Kigali today, will not even see a plastic bag because they take them away from you at the airport. Rwanda has developed, if you go to the main market, you cannot compare to Kenya. Yet Kenya has even oil. <laughs> the GDP per, per capita in Kenya is higher than Rwanda. Kenya has much, much more in terms of human resources and everything else. So where is the money going? Why haven't we developed? Why is Nairobi lagging behind uh, Kigali? 
already sababa. Now you get the point. It is leadership. Where Rwanda has a government who does not tolerate corruption and who is a worker, Kenya doesn't have anyone like him. That is where the, the, the problem has to be fixed. It is leadership. Thank you for that. Now, now, if you were to be elected the governor of Nairobi, what will your agenda for improvement and development of the county, especially in the first 100 days in the office? Uh, I, I don't do 100 days. I think that is a con job. Uh, most right. leaders who speak or promise 100 days are just conning the people, and I'm not a dishonest man. So I no. never, ever will promise anybody 100 days. There is very little you do in 100 days. How long it you intend to No, no, no. But it's five years. Everybody has five years. I will do mine in five years. I will not promise anybody anything in 100 days. Because the first thing you do, um, with me, for example, I will make sure that all the people that are being employed under me are vetted so that I have clean people. Then I do a thorough audit of the entire county to make sure that we know where we are financially and to make sure that we know where money is going and who is stealing, who is not stealing, to block all those loopholes. Then, of course, to get uh, the legislation agenda, you have to pass laws or align laws uh, that are not aligned, to align with the Constitution and to align with this ethical uh, system that you're bringing into being. By the time you're done that, three months is over. It's almost 100 days. The other time. Right. Then Are by the talking? time they, 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 they disburse funds and you start working, this 100 days, if Obama promised it, I don't remember. But if he did, he never met it. Nobody has. So I will promise what I will do in five years. But I will never I, promise 100 days. So are you trying to imply that for the first five years that you're going to be a governor of Nairobi, Nairobians are not going to see anything. It's, you are just going to be planning yourself in five I years' think, time. No, no, no. I, I think you're being dishonest now. No, you, are, you, you want the months. situation I where said, I... No, no, no. I said in three months. I don't know where you get five years. I said you asked for 100 days. Right. I said that that will be taken up on planning. And that is the truth. And then the balance of the time will be work. But it will not, work will not start. I mean, I'm a realistic. I've worked with the government. I've been an advisor to a prime minister. I know how things move. I'm not naive. So I know that you will not be sworn in, and the following day you get money from the Treasury to start working. That would be stupid of me. So I'm right. saying, no, it will not be 100 days. But in five years, for example, I would have my infrastructural plan unveiled and going uh, full throttle. Mm -hmm. I would have all the corruption loopholes blocked completely. I would have my housing plan full throttle. I will have the solid waste management system already installed. I would have the scholarship system that I am going to unveil already operational. So there are things that will be done. But I'm saying in 100 days, it would be a lie. How long? Can I, I said five years. Oh, five I thought years. that is what I started with. Every right. governor has only five years. And that is what you have to work with. And that is what I will work with. Okay. Well, and how, how, is there any, any observation from the panelists on the panel? Yes, yes. Um, yes. This Patrick, uh, Honorable Mugona, you have indicated uh, above that you'll uh, do a Tara audit. And in a previous interview elsewhere, mm -hmm. you have said that should you become the governor, you'll mm -hmm. cut out a forensic audit. And that is consistent with what you have said about yes, of everything and that you will not use a Kenyan company to do this audit. Why not so use a Kenyan company, Honorable? They are all corrupt, my friend. Come on, let's be real. <laughs> Which can, give me one Kenyan company that can do the audit. There is none. Listen, I lived in Kenya for eight years after having moved here from Canada um, uh, and then worked uh, for ODM and then eventually worked for the Grand Coalition government. 
I can tell you, I can tell you on my mother's grave, there is not one single company that can do a thorough audit that will stand a squat test. Done. So I will, I will get an audit firm or a, a group of professionals from abroad. I have no problem saying they will be from abroad, uh, and they will be one of the best. They will carry something without favor, without fear. They will finish, and they will go back to their country. They don't have to be scared of the cartels killing them. They will come, walk, and go. I will have the report, and I will enforce it. Uh, in, uh, thank you, Honorable. Uh, in, your, in your interviews and what you have uh, said above, you are very focused about the cartels that run the country, and indeed run Nairobi. How do you propose to wipe away these cartels? How do I propose to do it? Yes. Number one, uh, my friend, um, we all know that the cartels basically control the corruption, right? So when I talk of City Hall, uh, we know the main, I will explain to you the main mechanism, avenues. Uh, there is the land cartel, the ones that identify land, uh, leases, for example, that are expiring, that need to be renewed, and they either grab this land that is supposed to be reverted back to the country, or they grab public uh, land and infrastructure uh, that are lying idle or that um, are not being used. That is very easy to stop because after you have done an audit, and you will be doing an audit of land and all public assets, you will know where you are, where things are, what needs renewal and what does not need renewal, what things were not renewed properly or regularly, and what things have not been renewed that have been renewed regularly. You will also know what rates have not been paid and which property should be repossessed. Once you know that, then take charge. Now, through the audit, the people that have been involved in this activity will also be identified, and the companies, and the company's directors to take the information and to adduce it to the DP or whatever authority there will be, so they can always change by the time you get into positions of power, and have these things that these people prosecute. The problem now is that the people who are in charge of public uh, offices use the evidence that they gather to extort money uh, from the cartels or get into bed with the cartels so that they can share either land or assets with them. So that's land. Then you get to the tender, the tendering committee, and the systems within the tendering system to dismantle whatever system that there was before, and you reconstitute them with people you have vetted and that have passed the integrity. There is a chapter, the Constitution called the Integrity Chapter. Everybody would have to pass it for them to work for uh, in my administration. Once you have those tender committees reconstituted and you inject new blood, clean blood, the system should start moving. The cartels will not will no longer be there. The cartels thrive on connections that they have to people in power. That's how they thrive. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Moshiliwa Miguna Miguna. If I would just remind the listeners that this is AKD Radio, and we have um, Miguna Miguna with us today. Kojang, if I would hand back the floor to you. Kojang? Right. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, now, if I may ask uh, in part of your uh, governing council, whatever, uh, how do you plan to deal with the illegal street hawking that is an ISO in Nairobi and the resultant city as, as carried brutality? Very good question. 
um, hawking. Uh, my view of hawking is slightly different from yours, even though a lot of people think it is menace. Most of the hawkers are actually just uh, poor business women and men trying to survive. They are trying to sell their wares because they, they don't have a means. They are trying to, to earn a living, uh, but they don't know where to sell it. They don't have markets. They don't have a regulatory regime within to operate. So say, for example, if you go to New York, hey, uh, you will find hawkers, but they will be very few, and they will be regularized. They will know where they can go and where they cannot go. All you need in Nairobi, uh, which you don't have now, are adequate facilities markets that are affordable, accessible for these hawkers to use for purposes of selling their wares. And that's exactly what I will do. I will construct markets, public markets, that people can use, that are secure, they are clean, they are affordable, and these people will be able to get their customers without having to go into the CB. Then you will institute, I will institute bylaws that will be enforced by arresting people who are violating it. If you are selling in places you are not allowed to sell, you will be arrested and you will be prosecuted or fined. That will deal with the hawking system. Right now, Hidero spends most of his time learning where the loopholes are so that they can steal. Every single day is getting more than... 10 million uh, Kenya shillings delivered in briefcases at home, you know, from parking and whatnot. And these ones I know. So they, they are concentrating their effort and energy in where they can extract, not how they can bring order in the city. There will be a big difference and paradigm uh, shift. My concern will be getting order, law and order, getting the town and the city moving creating jobs. Once you create jobs, once you enforce some of these things that I'm talking about, you have a solid waste management system going. You have the slums uh, reconstruction going. You have road works being done. You have the C1 storm systems being done. They are, the youth that are on the street will not be there. They will be working. You know, the people that are working there are just people trying to find a, a means of livelihood. Once you create employment and you now hire them and they are working like here, there will be nobody on the street talking. People will find what they have to do. Thank you. Uh, uh, what compromises, if any, are you ready to make to win the Gibraltar area seat? Uh, it depends on with whom. Who am I supposed to make compromises with? I will not make any compromises with the cartels because making compromises with them means you become yourself a cartel agent. And, and so it defeats the whole purpose and, and the, the foundation of my campaign. I've been very consistent, my friend, since I was a young boy. I have not changed. I was a student leader in Nairobi in 1987, and we fought boy and his one-party dictatorship. And since then, I've not changed. I, I, I hope somebody can come and tell me this is where you changed. Never. Never bent an inch. Part of the reason why I do not survive with Raino Dinka is exactly what I'm doing. Never, ever changed. They wanted me to compromise, and I couldn't. I don't compromise with corruption. That is really where the discussion ends. Right. Bring it on the table, and I leave. <laughs> I get you now. Well, in our previous interview elsewhere, you have said that Nairobians should vote for you because you live like them and experience the same problems like them. Do you feel that you can identify with the needs of the common Nairobians on the streets? And also, uh, is your life and your experiences similar to that of the common Monaiji? My friend. Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't know what a common experience is, but I can tell you this. 
that when Americans speak of my experience, you speak of your experience, really what you mean is this. You live in the same environment. So if the environment is polluted, you breathe the same air. The pollution right. gets to you regardless of where you live. If right. there is garbage and it smells, it will stink into the mansion where somebody lives in Mutaiga as much as it will sting into Matari, even though they are separated by just a street. So the fact of the matter is that the traffic problem in Nairobi is not just affecting the poor, it's affecting the rich. Whether you are in your car or you are in your matatu, you will still not reach home when you should. Whether you're coming from the airport as a worker there, as a clerk, or as a hawker, or as a seller, or as an executive, or as even an ambassador, you will still not be able to reach where you're going on time. That problem will affect you regardless. So that's just two examples. When you see the slums all over, even if I don't live in Madari, or I don't live in Korogocho, for example, which is the next farm where I live, who works for you? Who cuts your garden? Who cooks your food? Who takes care of your children? The same, same person who lives in the slums. If they have a disease, a bacterial disease, the child will get it. There is no safety. There is nothing like I am safe from the problem of the Nairobian. That problem is with you because I have not seen even Moy, who stole the most and has most of the money, even the Kenyatta family, where they can tell you all their relatives are rich, every single person they know is rich, everybody they interact with live in Mudaega. There is nobody like that. Thank you very much, uh, Moishimiwa. Thank you very much, Kojong, as well. Uh, to the listeners, we're having uh, Miguna Miguna today with us at the KB Radio. Now, if we could move on to the next set of questions. Dugu Patrick, if you are listening to me, could you take over, please? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Honorable Miguna, uh, what is your take on the government limiting interest rates on bank loans by law? Uh, to tell you the truth, that thing was over long, long time ago. The interest rates in Kenya have been illegal for a very long time. They shouldn't have been as high as they are. For people like us who are uh, lucky to, to either have gone to school or work or live in North America, for example, we know that the rates never go even to 10. That if they go to 10, you are probably going to a money lender. You're not going to a bank. And if the mortgage rate reaches 10, it is unsustainable. There is no economy that can grow like that. So the people will not be able to own homes, they will not be able to buy vehicles, and any economy where people do not borrow, it cannot grow because businesses rely on, on, on loans to, to start and, and, and to increase, expand, and to grow. So the interest rates were stifling development and they were long overdue. I think they are still too high, even with the so-called uh, new law. And then we will have to, we can't celebrate too early. We have to see implementation. We want to see whether the banks will use back uh, strategies to get around the law. Uh, that is the only time we'll be able to say we've made some progress. But it's a good move. It's a good move in the right direction. Thank you very much. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on the recent turn of events with the IEEC commissioners going home, their settlement, and the ongoing discussions on the way forward? I don't know if they are going home, but if they are going home, but that also is long overdue. I mean, I, I, unlike a lot of people, I've been involved in a lot of things, so I never celebrate. I never, ever count my chickens before they actually hatch. So until they go home, I am not saying they have gone. I don't do that. I'm a very, very careful person by nature. So, but they should have gone already. I think they bungled the last elections badly. And I opposed uh, this commission, particularly the head, from the, go the word go. It is just right I did not listen to me. Had he listened to me, 
would not have been crying in 2013. I told him this man was not capable. He has never been capable. He has never been ready. He doesn't have integrity, he never did, but should never have been able to occupy such an important office. Now, the question is, what is to be done? I don't think they should be paid a dime. I, I think that a person who did the kind of things that they did, and I'm not talking about the presidential election, I'm just talking about elections generally, should go to jail, should not be rewarded uh, by being given packages that they are going home. Uh, then secondly, who is going to replace them? Is there a mechanism of selecting Kenyans with integrity to preside over elections? Elections are very, very critical, as critical as the judiciary. And the judiciary is, is already rotten. If you have this wrong, Kenya is going to go to flames. So they must have it right. And I'm not sure if they have everything together to have it right. I, I don't know. Are we cut? Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. If you could continue, please. Yeah. Uh, Honorable, you were part of the team that drafted the constitution. And you say that this constitution will one day be implemented properly, as it should, taking the Kenyan landscape into perspective of what methods should be put in place. You know, constitution is a living thing for those who know about constitution. It's like a child. It's like a tree. The constitution is never static, just like civilization, dynamic. It, we breathe life into the constitution as we implement it. We correct things as we implement it. The British, for the longest while, had Magna Carta, it was never written. They have been able to get a, a democratic system in place without a written constitution. Don't need anything written to become a constitutional democracy. What we need as leaders of integrity to take charge of leadership to bring a constitutional dispensation. So I don't, uh, I don't give a lot of weight to written documents if you don't have implementers who can actually enforce them. It's just a piece of paper. But it's only when you have leaders who can implement it that we can talk about whether or not it will be implemented fully. For as long as Kenya is governed by thieves and crooks, the majority of them, the constitution will never be implemented. But the moment you clean up the system and you start having uh, men and women of integrity, people who are <coughs> dedicated to public service, they are not entering public service to make money, uh, then it becomes second nature. The constitution will be implemented. And they can even do better than what is written. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Patrick. Thank you very much, Miguna Miguna. Um, the listeners, this is AKD Radio, and we have uh, the Honorable Miguna Miguna with us today. If we could move on to the next session, I'm going to invite uh, Ephraim Imaya to take over the floor. Ephraim Imaya, if you're listening, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Miguna Miguna, as a diaspora Kenyan yourself, how do you think Kenya can best tap the potential of the Kenyan diaspora rather than just waiting for the remittances? <laughs> That's another good one. <laughs> and that has been asked over and over again, and I have a problem, a very big problem. Kenya, uh, not Kenya as a state, but Kenyans in Kenya have a very funny relationship with the diaspora. They want your money, but they don't want your input. If you bring ideas that are unique, fresh, or even superior to ideas they are used to, they tell you, go back, go back to America. It is as if, I've never seen that kind of tendency except in, in Africa. If you go to any other country, you go to Philippines, you go to Israel, uh, you go to Italy, you go to Greece, they welcome their, um, their, their citizens that left and have made something out of life outside their country and are coming back with the new
new expertise, new experiences, new innovative ideas, money. They welcome them. They have created ministries, all departments that are just run by people from abroad, not in Kenya. And, and the, the reason being that the system is controlled by cartels who know that new ideas will bring transparency, will bring accountability, that will deny them oxygen. So chaos is a system uh, where crooks thrive. A clean system, a crook cannot thrive in a clean system. So they know that if you allow a lot of the diaspora to have a say in the management of public affairs, you will have sufficient numbers that will be able to influence how matters will be run, how affairs will be run, and they will become transparent. My challenge to the diaspora is this, because I think the diaspora, part of the blame is on the diaspora. First, don't speak uh, often enough, don't speak loud enough, don't speak in a united way, and you don't support good causes. The diaspora allows itself to fall in the same, same traps of the people in Kenya, doing things because Raila said, because Uhuru said, because it is a kikuyu, because it is a luo, oh, I don't like a lawyer. This is what has brought us where we are. So we are as fragmented in the diaspora as we are fragmented in the country. And when you are fragmented and you are being ruled and governed by the, the crooks, they love it. Because let me ask you, which mm -hmm. country in the world can have Sonko as, as a senator? Which country in the world the man barely knows how to read, leave alone write. The man is a confessed prison convict that ran away from prison, meaning he still has a criminal record. The man sells drugs openly. People know this. But because he uses the money that he collects to distribute around the neighborhoods of the poor, he's supposed to be a darling of the poor. But does the diaspora speak? No, you don't. Do you demand that the Jubilee administration, for example, reopen the report that the CIA and the FBI gave for, on drug trafficking and named people like him and Joho and, and Kavogo? No. You are in America. You have never made it to the State Department to ask for a copy you have not gone to carry or petition him to put pressure on Uhuru to do this. So the system thrives because diaspora does not take its due place. You have a central uh, role to play, and I think you have abrogated that position. That's my view. Okay. Um, do, do you think then that uh, there is time for the Electoral Commission to register the Kenyans in the diaspora? vote in 2017? No, there is no time, and they will not be registered. Why do you think so? Well, there is no time. You see, there is no time. First of all, let me tell you this. When, when, when court made the demand for the disbandment of the Electoral Commission, the main central demand, which they never got and nobody's talking about, we wanted a new register. If you guys remember. You know, Kenyans, I don't know what's wrong. People have very short memories. They said, we want a new register. They didn't want the old register. They did not want it cleaned. They wanted a new one. To get a new register, which is then, which would mean that you are registering people afresh. You go out there and people register afresh so that you don't have dead people and dogs registering as voters. Uh, that would ensure that nobody else that is not supposed to vote, votes. That is the only way you have a clean and fair election. So we didn't have that. So if they cannot even have a new register, how are they going to register you? If they believe that they don't have enough time, or they don't have enough money, or they don't have enough personnel to be able to register Kenyans in Kenya, how are they going to register you? are the saddest thing from their minds. 
And you see, <laughs> another reason they cannot register you. Any government knows that the diaspora population normally is a very skeptical, very difficult population to deal with because they are more urban, they are more probably learned, uh, they have experiences from all over. So they will be scrutinizing a lot of things. That is not what a government likes. That is not a population of voters that you like. You want to keep those ones away. So it's not in the Jubilee's best interest to register you guys. Because most of you probably will vote court. Okay. It, it is reported. It's, it's reported that you are doing very well as a solicitor and a barrister in Canada, as you're flourishing. And uh, this is mainly due to your own hard work. What would you tell fellow Kenyans in the diaspora that want to do the same and uh, are at the very bottom of the rung, of the ladder, rather? How do they get to the top? Get to the top through hard work. Really, I mean, there is no option. And here, particularly in the West, I think a lot of people know this. Hard work and smart. You act smart. First of all, I mean, what I tell everybody, study what you know. Don't let somebody tell you study this, study this, because I did this or I did that. Don't, don't, don't be influenced by anyone. Just do what you know. If you know math, do math. If you know English, just do English. If you know history, just do history. Thrive in what you know. Excel in what you know. You will be the best in what you know. Then, then nature takes its course. It will place you where it places you. And you would have done the best that you can. Just be honest, work hard, and do what you know. Okay. And be consistent and never give up. Um, if you are elected as governor, will it be safe for your family to live in Kenya? Uh, because uh, previously it was reported that goons were after you and your family. So I think where people, families live, that's now a private matter. I don't know where Uru's children live or where Raila's children live. I think that those are personal issues. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I will live in Kenya. I will be the governor. My wife will not be. Where my wife lives, I think, would become inconsequential, isn't it? So she will not be in the cabinet. I don't encourage nepotism. So she'll never get appointed to the to, to county government. So what she does, where she lives, becomes irrelevant. Pedro's wife works for Coca-Cola, you know, Coca-Cola, which is a U.S. company, and spends probably half her time in the U.S. Who cares? Okay. Th 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 thank you, um, Naguna Naguna. Back to the moderator. Uh, thank you very much, Miguna Miguna, and thank you very much, uh, Imaya, for that. Uh, we're now going to the last set of questions as time is going on. Uh, listeners, this is AKD Radio, and in the house today we've got uh, the Honorable Miguna Miguna with us. I'm now going to invite uh, the fellow panelists, my fellow panelists, Bernard Omweri is from America. Bernard, if you're listening, this is your floor. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Miguna, Miguna Miguna. You speak quite candidly of Nyando, your village. Do you go there quite often? You know, I can't hear you properly. I don't know what's happening. It's fine. Uh, I'm saying you you speak qu uh, quite candidly about uh, Nyando, your village. Do you go there? I can't often? hear you. I can't hear properly. Oh, oh let, me, let me see why it's, you it's can't cutting. hear me. It's cutting. I cannot hear you comprehensively. Uh, let, me turn, let me turn my, my mic a little bit. Um, yeah, high. there is a problem. Can you hear me there now? I can hear you, but it's not as clear as the others, but go ahead. Okay, um, my question is, you speak quite kindly uh, of Nyando, your village. Do you go Am I what? In your Nyando. Village, Am in, I what? In your village of Nyando. What about my village? I'm saying you speak quite candidly of Nyando, your village. Am I still what? Can somebody please just make? Me? I don't. I don't. I, I'm not hearing. Um, okay, let me let, let me let me. Bernard, uh, sorting out. Bernard, if, as you sorting out uh, your speaker, let me. I, I think I've heard you clearly. What um, 
the nerd is asking is that you speak quite candidly of Nyando, your village. Oh, I speak uh, quite candidly. Okay, fine. Yeah. Nyando, the village. And is asking, do you go there often? Of course I go to my village. Why? I don't understand. Why wouldn't I go to my village? Well, that's just a question opening up. Bernard, are you ready to take over the rest of the questions? How is like, that connected to Nairobi? How is that? Why do we still talk about villages when I am running for Nairobi County? Uh, you know, uh, they... Go ahead, Sheila. Uh, what is the connection between my village and Nairobi? The connection between your village and the Nairobi Mwishimua is that this is a personal journey that you made. I think there more questions that Bernard will ask about if you see the relevance why it has to do with running in Nairobi. Uh, Bernard... Oh, I don't see the relevance. I go to my village like everybody else. Oh, uh, yeah. So then maybe the next question Bernard will ask to make it more clear. Bernard, so you try to see if your speaker is uh, working okay or otherwise I may have to, to be a translator for you. Uh, are you a celebrated son of your village? As villagers are known to do so once of their own makes it. What kind of nonsense is that? that? That is complete nonsense, my friend. And I mean, I call it nonsense because it is. Um, what do you mean am I a celebrated son of my village? Why don't you go and ask the villagers? No, that is what, what we really want, uh, Mr. Meguna Meguna. Let's no, no, your... no. It's, complete, it's completely irrelevant. I'm not going to deal with irrelevant questions. What okay. does that have to do with Nairobi? Okay, let me let me get, let, let me bring you home. Have there been any projects that you have done at your home village for the people? What kind of rubbish is this? I'm a private citizen, my friend. Just like you. What you do in your village or you do with your family is your business. You pay taxes like everybody else, and that's all that counts. You are entitled to run for public office on the basis of your manifesto, not on the basis of building or or or, or, uh, or boring a water hole. Or, those are rubbish third world mentality issues. I don't deal with that. Okay, Honorable Miguna, Miguna, you. I don't spoken... deal with that because it is completely relevant to public service. You have spoken about. We are about talking Mr. about Bam. a county. We are not talking about a village. That is okay, you. But you've spoken about Mr. Obama rising from a very, very humble background. He did a community work. And he did not build anything in his village in Nyangoma Kogelo in, in 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 Kenya. I'm talking of Chicago, my brother. I'm talking of Chicago. He did a lot of work in Chicago. I can't you are, hear you well. I'm saying he did a lot of work in Chicago. You understand that? No, I can't hear you. I, I don't know. Maybe Sheila, there is a conspiracy to deny you the, the air because of your question, but, but I can't actually hear properly. Okay, ca Sheila, can Sheila, you please you ask have me a if, if, if I may come in for a while. Okay, now that we are speaking about villages, and I do appreciate that uh, the Honorable Guest seems to be relevant, but my question to you about uh, villages, um, Miguna, Miguna. If what would you say to someone from a village, not necessarily a village, any village in Kenya who wants to make the same steps as we've made, come from a humble village and somehow be up there in the world pedestal, what would you advise that little child in the village for the way forward to reach it's their to height? Hard. To it's to work hard. That's what I did. I mean, that's what everybody who came from a village and made it anywhere did. That's what Kibaki did. But he came from a village just like mine. He went to Makarere, he made a life of himself, and he became president. He worked from a village. Everybody who came from a village and became anything just worked hard. That's what you tell to a villager. That's what you tell a small child. But there is no way I can encourage this third world mentality that, that if you are a private citizen, you have to build a school, you have to build a borehole. What nonsense is that? That has nothing to do with leadership. Most of these people building boreholes, it is because they have stolen 100 million and they want to, to, to mislead the people by building two things and pretending that they are doing anything development when they are stealing millions of, of Kenya shillings which belong to the people. This is a third world mentality. Nobody talks like that in the West. And we were not born. God did not create Africans after the white people. So I will not reduce myself to that level. 
But what would you say to the people who subscribe to the school of thought that say charity begins at home? Charity is what I've been doing since I was a small boy, fighting for justice. That's more than building a borehole. Defeating mm-hmm. one one party rule, one party rule after 24 years of canoe dictatorship mm-hmm. is what mm-hmm. more than than a borehole. And I'm not saying I've not built. I'm just saying I will never discuss that with anybody because it is irrelevant. I've done a lot of things that I will not discuss because they are irrelevant. And I don't, dis- I don't encourage that kind of talk. Mm-hmm. Because it is diversionary, it completely makes us sound and, and, and reason very, very badly. Mm-hmm. Let me go to- uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I have, yes, a, Bernard. I have yes. a question. Yes, Patrick. Uh, honorable you, we talked about running the country. And I believe even villages are in the country that you'll be running. Because if you move from governorship, you will be heading to run the country. I missed that, uh, Honorable. Yeah, I'm saying. Yeah. I'm not running for president. I just said that if given an opportunity, I can run Kenya very easily. There is nothing very difficult about running the country. Mr. Miguna, Miguna. Okay. Let me come back. There are but few go things, ahead and ask your question. Yes. There are a few things um, 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 as a leader you must actually have done to your people for them to emulate or for them to vote for you to be to be a governor of Nairobi. They need to see your track record. That's why I'm actually asking you. From the village level going up to Nairobi, at, at least there's some fundamental facts, I mean fundamental steps you've really done for them. For them to say that you are really a qualified to be a leader. That is what I was asking, Mr. Miguna Miguna. So I think you 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 are not ready. I, I think you are still operating at a very a very, very pedantic intellectual level. And I will tell you the way it is. Let me answer you. What did Kidero do before he was elected governor? He stole it from Mumias and he, co- he collapsed Mumias. Bankrupted Mumias. That's what he did. What had he done? What had Uru done? become president? What village had he built? What village had Ruto built? What village did Raila build? What village did Obama build? You know, don't ask questions without thinking through what you are saying. We live in, 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 in a world that is made of human civilizations. What had Mandela done to his village before he was elected president? What had Nkrumah done? What had Kenyatta done? Kenyatta went and lived abroad for 10 years as a gardener, came back and became president. What had he built in Gatundu? So don't ask questions as if you are talking to someone who does not think. Okay, let's leave that one. Let, let, let's leave that. Let's, so leave let's... the village completely out of this because you will not win that one. Uh, I'm no, I'm, I'm not running for a governor's position, uh, Mr. Miguna Miguna. No, no, I'm but running, I'm, but I'm not running on the basis that any question or if you ask me something that makes sense or does not make sense, that just because I'm looking for votes, I will talk like your typical politician who is so cornish, who is so hypocritical, who is so deceptive, who puts up a fake humility to get votes. I don't do that. That's okay. I'm good with that, Mr. Migona. Let's go to the next question. You were a powerful and influential senior advisor to Raila Odinga. When you fell out with him, however, you had a scathing expose on him, captured in your book. I had a what? You had a scathing expose on him, expose on him. What is it? What was the expose I had on him? It's captured in your book. Peeling back the mask. What was it? Tell me what it was. Peeling, Peeling the mask. What did the book is 600 pages? What exactly are you talking about? A book is 600 pages. What question are you asking about the book? The book. I mean, uh, we cannot start discussing about the book, but basically, the book is so, uh, giving. So what chapter? What page? What particular issue are you asking about the book? If you have read it, 
I can't stop. You can't ask a book. You can't ask a question about a book you have not read. And if you have read it, tell me the chapter, tell me the page, tell me what you are asking about. Okay, why did you live with all this impropriety until the falling out? Or was it just what, a case did I live with what? Have you read the book? Have, have you read, read the book? I've read the book on of, uh, entirely. I mean, uh, entirely. I've, if you I've have read, read the book, book, tell me which chapter you have issue with. Tell me which one. The issue of saying that Raila is a con man. Raila is not. I mean, Raila is not ready to be a uh, to be a prime minister. I mean, to be a president of Kenya. He what is wrong live. with that? What is wrong with saying that? That is what will lead you to, I mean, to, uh, to, to expose a little bit more. No, no, I'm asking you, what yes. is wrong uh -huh. with me saying that? What issue do you have there? Raila's built roads in Nairobi. You know that one very well. They build roads from what? You don't know that Raila built a build road when he was a public minister, I mean, a, 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 a road a work minister? He was a minister in the government of the Republic of Kenya. Surely. Did he, I mean, did, uh, did he... Did no, no, no. But did I say Raila did not build? Raila was not a minister of roads. I'm trying to tell Is you. Is there anywhere in my book where I say Raila was not a minister of roads? I'm not. You're Mr. Miguna Miguna. No, no, no. I'm that. asking you. You said that I said this, and I'm asking you. Is there anywhere you in my book where I say Raila was not minister of roads? You said. Is okay, the moderator. The moderator. Of bleeding. Uh, Bernard and the the no sense. What does he have a, a problem with in the book? Tell me what the problem is in the book. Bernard and the Honorable Miguna Miguna, I am going to step in right now and I am going to say we let that question lie. My question to you, uh, Mr. Miguna Miguna, just before we call off, my last question to you before I give you the floor to talk to the Nairobi workers. Uh, do you think you could work with Russia again if the opportunity presented itself? You see, my friend, the problem I normally have is this. People accuse me of things I have not done. You see, if somebody, mm -hmm. wants, to say, if somebody wants to say that you did something wrong, mm -hmm. it better be that that thing is wrong. So let's say, for example, you say something and it is not true. Somebody can mm -hmm. say, look, you say this, but in fact, the fact is this. Mm -hmm. so, so at least you can discuss it. But if mm -hmm. you didn't lie in the book, what is the problem? So let me tell you this. Whether or not yeah. I can work with Raila Odinga, mm -hmm. I can work with anyone in a position mm -hmm. of responsibility. Yeah. If, say, for example, I'm elected governor, yeah. and Uru Kenyatta is the president, or Raila is the president, mm -hmm. you have to work with them, because they yeah. occupy a public office that you must work with. Mm -hmm. But I don't have to work with them as an individual. This is not about friendship. This is not about whether you like somebody or not. Mm -hmm. This is about respecting institutions. Mm -hmm. Listen, I practice law. Yeah. And we go to court here, even in, in, uh, in Ontario here. Yeah. And there are judges or police officers that we know are racist. Yeah. Don't I still go to the same courthouse and still represent a client, even though I know the police officer is racist? If I can do it here, mm -hmm. which is the headquarters of Retizu, what mm -hmm. would prevent me from working with someone whom I disagreed with politically in Kenya? Mm -hmm. I was in the same, same government, representing the same, same Rai Rodinga, and could mm -hmm. meet with the advisor to Kibaki, whom they were not seeing eye to eye with. And sometimes I was the one negotiating between them. No matter mm -hmm. what the propaganda is. Even within ODM itself, there are ministers, if this man has read the book, there are ministers Raila could not speak with that I was the only one who could, could speak with them on behalf of Raila. Mm -hmm. And then people tell me I would not be able to work with anybody. How was I able to do it for, for more than six years? Mm -hmm. I mean, these people just forgot that this man was with Raila for six years mm -hmm. and was at a very high position. And within mm -hmm. the party, not everybody agreed that Raila sometimes was not even talking to Ruto, for example. Mm -hmm. But I could go and meet with Ruto and come back and tell Raila what Ruto said. Mm -hmm. If I was able to do it then, what happened to me now? Mm -hmm. so 
it's just common sense. I don't understand why people don't just be yourself and use your brain. This man has not lost his brain. He's mm -hmm. the same, same one that was there and you were praising all day long when he was helping Raila get power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miguna Miguna. And uh, I would just like to give you a few minutes to address the listeners uh, that are listening um, and uh, just give them a few minutes before we wrap this up. Um, I would just want to say this, that um, we are at a very, very um, important juncture in the history of our country and the history of the county of the city of Nairobi. Um, Kenyans have to make a decision whether they want to move forward or stay in the same position they have been since uh, independence. We've been stuck with a corrupt system, with leaders that steal from the city rather than providing service. And I can hear a child. <laughs> Sorry about that. And uh, voters have to realize that the power is in their hands. Whether they elect leaders that they can trust, leaders of integrity, that will be able to take care of the money, the taxes that they pay. Or they will continue to have the same, same status quo of leaders that steal every single cent that, that they pay uh, towards taxes. I represent this uh, kind of fresh leadership, leaders from outside the, the cartel-controlled system in Nairobi that are trying to clean up city halls and bring order, accountability, efficiency, and integrity to the system. And I think that is what the citizens vote for. That's what I'm bringing. That's all I am bringing. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Miguna Miguna. And uh, from the panelists, if anyone has a parting shot to give to Miguna Miguna, this is the time. Hello. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm just thanking you very much, uh, Miguna Miguna. Thank you for your time. It's been a brilliant chat we've had with you. I'm just going to ask if any of the panel members has anything, any parting shot to say to you. I'll start with you for John. So John, do you have anything to say to Miguna Miguna before we listen? Uh, what I must say with uh, Miguna, that we need people like you. Uh, uh, I just like the way he's tackling the issues. And I believe and I trust that uh, whatever he's saying is not just a uh, mere say to please us, but uh, it's really going to be very practical and we, uh, we wait to see. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, John, Patrick, do you have any parting shots to say to our guests before we leave? Patrick, are you there? Oh. As, as we wait for Patrick, I would like to ask Bernard. Bernard, do you have any parting shots to give uh, the guest of honor before he leaves? Well, thank you, Mr. Miguna Miguna, for being part of our discussion. And uh, maybe next time we'll, we'll call you to... Um, give some more input about your uh, gubernatorial um, uh, seat in Nairobi. Uh, we are here to assist every Kenyan and uh, we like you, we love you. So uh, anytime you feel to talk to us, please, Miguna Miguna, we are pretty open and we are interviewing every Kenyan who is ready to work for Kenyans. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, for, for, for this interview. Uh, may God bless you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Bernard. And uh, now, if I could ask if I may, if he has anything to say to our Mushinua before he goes. Thank you, Honorable Miguna Miguna, for a fantastic interview and uh, for, for a very candid um, re response to our questions and also for, 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 for your stand on, on corruption and good governance. And we wish you the best. And I think Nairobians uh, have, a, have a good um, candidate in you and, uh, and, and hope they make the right choice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maya. Patrick, one more time, I'll try. If you're there, Patrick, are you there? Uh, okay, I'm not Yeah, I'm here. Patrick, are you there? Okay. Yeah, I'm here. 
Honorable Miguna, thank you very much for your time and for uh, standing firm with on what you believe, and I wish you well. We look forward to have more of these interviews with you again. Thank uh, you, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, Miguna Miguna, that is thank you from Association of Kenyans in the Diaspora. We've had a pleasant time with you. I must thank you from the bottom of my heart and say that you've been just uh, wonderful and brilliant in this interview. You've been candid, you've been honest, you've been open and very elaborative in your answers. On behalf of Association of Kenyans in the Diaspora, we do thank you. And we hope that this is just the beginning of uh, many more chats like this with you. We take this opportunity to wish you the very best in all you're doing in this uh, gubernatorial rest. We wish you all the best. And uh, we'd just like to say thank you once more. Hello, Miguna Miguna, are you still there? Did you drop out something? Hello. Okay, check it. Um, Can you try to just try to reconnect him yeah, he's, he's still we... there, probably maybe he's off the line, but he's still there, he's still active on the line. Can you rec I mean can you shut him then you reconnect him? Oh okay. Uh, to the listeners, uh, we also would like to thank you very much for being with us uh, during this time. Uh, we felt your support. Uh, so thank you very much and I hope you did enjoy the interview as much as we did. Hello. Hello, hello. Did I see that? What have you guys done to me? I was talking to myself. Right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm very sorry about that. Did you get anything I said? Miguna, Miguna, did you get any of my articles? Oh, sorry. I was warning that you guys went off the air. Oh, oh. sorry. We do apologize about that. Oh, but what anyway, uh, I think the call just dropped off. We didn't even know. I was talking to myself as well. I did. I was talking to you. So I thought I was addressing you and then found out. When you didn't respond, I realized you are not there. We do apologize for this. Anyway, as I was saying, Miguna Miguna, we thank you very much on behalf of Association of Kenyans in the Diaspora. We would like to say we are very grateful for allowing us this time to have this chat with you. You've been most candid, most elaborative in your answers. And... Um, we just are grateful and we appreciate the time you've given us. We really wish you the best in all your endeavors, and certainly we wish that you will succeed in being the next governor of Nairobi because you said all the right things that we want to hear, all the right plans that you want our city to be about. So we do thank you very much for that, and we hope that this is the first of many interviews with you. So on behalf of Association of Kenyans in the Diaspora, our heartfelt thanks. Thank you. Uh, you, you. If you're okay to drop the call right now, it's okay you can drop the call. The interview's finished. I'll catch up with you more on the email. Thank you. Thank you. So for the list... Hello? Mr. Kujuang, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. And Sheila was speaking, and then you your phone just went off also. Oh, sorry. 